I'm not going to walk that way because I like that. Uh, I see a lot of new faces, and so welcome to all of our new friends. I'm really glad that you found us, and hopefully you made some more connections. Um, if you've been here before, you know that I always praise my board. We are a team of volunteers. Um, it takes all of us to put on these events every month. Um, and I am fortunate enough to serve side by side with these beautiful, wonderful, amazing, talented people that you see here. Um, so thank you to everyone for your hard work of pulling off great programming every month for us here at AITP. And we have a really incredible Mac. We met last month, and uh, we meet twice a year. Our Mac is our advisory board. It's CIOs who help give us advice about trending topics and give us advice about speakers and program ideas for the next year. And so thank you to our board and our Mac, all of which are volunteers, but to help us guide you all to provide value-added programming um, for AICP. I was telling Gary, our speaker today, that we are a 40-year-old association here in AICP and have been meeting religiously second Thursday every month for 40 years, which I think is a good achievement. Um, we have great programs and technologies. You can see on the left the types of uh, programs we have. Oh my gosh. You didn't need that. Um, that we've had to date. Tonight we're going to hear from Gary from our NC Chamber a little bit about the winning formula for NC for business, why companies are moving here, all the cool things that are happening here. He's ready to answer your questions. Um, and we've been on kind of a road trip. So this is our default. This is our home. We love the U Club. They take really good care of us. We're here a lot of times. But the next three months, we're actually um, going to alternative <coughs> sites. So next month, we're going to be at Blue Cross Blue Shield out in Chapel Hill, hearing from their CTO, Joe Bisanti. Um, Our holiday party saved the day. I know there are a lot of holiday parties. December gets crazy busy. You get invited to a lot of cool places to be. Hopefully you'll join us on December 14th at Clouds Brewing. And we have a special guest that are here tonight, and I'm looking. Oh, thank you. We have a special guest, our, our magician and tarot card readers, Wayne and Mary Ann. So, we're going to spice things up, and at our December holiday party, you can have some magic, have some fun, get your future read to plan for your 2024 to know what's going to happen. So they joined us tonight, and they'll be back on December 14th, so we're excited about that. I think that'll be way better than my trivia last year that people <laughs> had positive feedback on. But, um, we're looking forward to it. And then January, we're going to be at Pendo. So um, that's another exciting field trip, and we get to check out their downtown headquarters space. Um, when we do field trips, it is a little bit more expensive for us to have vendors and catering and a bar tab like we did last month with our hat and in the future. So if your company is in their marketing budgeting season for the next year, for 2024, please ask your marketing department if they want to earmark any money for our organization <laughs> and talk to our membership director, Brooke. We are looking for a sponsor for Pendo or any event in 2024, rather. So we know, again, budgeting time of year, it's a great time to talk to your marketing department about, hey, how much money do you have for this great organization, AITP, that I found a lot of value going to their events at and have networked and connected and think I could maybe recruit some people out of to come, you know, grow our company um, and get some good publicity and press. So, Pendo, we're looking for a sponsor. Save the date. Always second Thursday, but the location is changing. The next couple of months. We're also growing. Last month we had a lot of new members. Within the past 30 days, we have 10 new members. Thank you to some of you in the room who here is on this list as a new member of the last 30 days. Thank you. And, and Vern, you're a group member with your company, Dexian. Thank you. We recognized you last month. I think you joined like the day before the Red Hat event, just so you could get your whole team in. <laughs> we appreciate it. We understand. And then Candle Science is our new group member as well. It's Lewis here. Okay. I haven't met him yet. I don't even know him. Maybe he'll be at our next event. Anybody. Is anyone from Candle Science here? Great friend. 
All right. What is membership? So those of you that are guests, if this is your first time, um, we have a couple of flexible choices for membership. Um, we are a not-for-profit, but it costs money to pay you to provide drinks and programming and have space. Um, our annual membership is still high value, almost steel, at $195 a year. Um, it's an annual renewal, so just because it is October, if you sign up now, your renewal date is 12 months from now. It's not based on the calendar year. It includes 12 months of programs, speakers, food, networking, and a drink ticket. But if you are a job seeker and just want to try us out and are not sure if this is going to be something that is great for you, you can join as a quarterly member. Three-month membership is kind of like our try before you buy, like long-term <laughs> commitment. It's just dating. And um, it's $90 for three months. Or you can continue to come as a guest. I still have a guest list. Guest fee. For $45. If you know any good PowerPoint, help. Copyright editor. Continue to come as a guest as often as you want. But what your membership dues does is it covers you for 12 months. The meal, the networking, the drinks. And if you can't come, you can proxy your seat and invite a guest. So if you have a friend that lost their job, that would be really beneficial for them to come and network. If the topic is like security and you're not a security person, but there's a coworker or someone on your team that's really into security, send someone that would benefit from that program or topic. And again, you can talk to Brooke at membership or visit our website for more details. Group membership, I mentioned Vernon Dexian and Candle Science are two new group members. State Employee Credit Union is also a group member. This is like a corporate membership. Um, CIOs like to use this, or leaders like to use this to recognize employees and bring people from their team. So it's not an individual membership, it's a company, and they can select five people to come to every event. Um, so group membership is for the low price of $975 annually, and it includes five seats basically at all 12 of our events. And are you excited <laughs> about Oprah and our friendly reminder? Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is my polite reminder for our members. We have a couple of times where this has become a question, including tonight. So I want to remind our members, it really helps us to provide accurate headcount for seating, especially when we're not here, because they are super accommodating here at the youth club. I cannot say positive enough things about them. But when we're going off site, we have other vendors that need to plan for food, alcohol, bartenders, security, etc. cetera. It really helps us if you RSVP early. So we try to have the save the date information on our website for events, and we'll be opening up the event for November tonight. If it's not already open, for you to start registering for the next month event. The earlier you RSVP, the better, and we appreciate you. Also, just because your membership is paid for for the whole year, we need to know if you're going to attend, because not every member attends all 12 months. So please help us plan accordingly by actually registering and RSVPing for the event. Same issue, food and seating. And next month, we are on a field trip again to Blue Cross Blue Shield. Due to some vendor constraints, again, the plan for food, we need to shut off registration early like we did at Red Hat. So Monday, November 6th at midnight will be our cutoff for that event. Appreciate you knowing, now I'm letting you know. Also, sometimes we can't make it when we want to proxy our seat. And I don't know that everyone understands how to proxy their seat. We always talk about it. And then I get the email the day of that says, oh, I can't make it tonight, so my friend Susie Q is going to come in my place. Which is great, but it would be helpful for us as a board if you could follow this process. Pretty sweet, pretty easy. Brooke, myself, any member of my board is willing to send you an email with these instructions, or you can take a picture and just have it on your phone. But get familiar with Wild Apricot, it's really just as easy as you're going to go in like you're pretending to register for yourself. And when it asks you on the second screen for the registration's information, you're going to switch your name for your friend's name. 
You're still going to leave your email in there. You're going to get the registration confirmation email, and then you're going to forward it to your buddy. And then your buddy is going to have it when they show up at the door, and Frank checks you in, because then we're going to know who the buddy is that's showing up at the door. <laughs> Again, we don't print name tags, so it's not that big of a deal. It just helps for an easier check-in process for us. So thank you for your attention for my friendly reminders. And then sponsorship, we talked a little bit about it. We had a sponsor last month at Red Hat. I think we have a sponsor at November and December events. But again, 2024 is wide open. And depending on the level that you sponsor at, at this level, you get to pick the speaker. So if you have a company and have technology, subject matter experts that have really great innovation, things that they're doing that are really exciting and you want to get on our 2024 programming and schedule, talk to Brooke or me or one of our VPs about how to save your future date. And thank you for our sponsors this year. Again, we have some event sponsors, but these are our uh, presenting chapter or higher level sponsors. And that is all you have to hear for me. So now we're going to get ready. To hear from uh, <laughs> Gary. So, Gary is the president and CEO of the NC Chamber, and he has decades of experience in North Carolina. I found out he's an upstate New Yorker like myself. New York and New York. Yeah. Um, <laughs> father was an IBMer, came down here, worked at GSK for a few years before joining North Carolina business. Um, has interest in lobbying and advocacy of how we help grow our lovely city that we all call home. And now he's been named the Chief Operating Officer and Active President in 2018, CEO in 2019, and he's helping to continue to advance our state um, to propel this as a top-ranked place to live, work, grow a business, be employed, and move. And so he will be honored to answer your questions and talk about how we are helping NC grow. All right, let's switch gears. Gary, let's please welcome Gary. Okay. I don't know if I'm that. Welcome to the family. Oh. <laughs> uh, I will ask. I, I kind of like being uh, Italian heritage. I kind of like to walk and use my hands. So I'll drop this. Are you here okay? If, if, I, if not, I would. Gladly, gladly pick stay it up. in front of this table. Okay. <laughs> uh, so thanks. Uh, thank you, Kay, and uh, thank you, Richard, and everybody. It's nice to meet some, some folks tonight from, from back home. And uh, a little bit about me is a, a little bit unique is actually, I, I have an alumni with us, Linda and I were talking. She went to Union, and I went to the Albany College of Pharmacy. I'm a pharmacist by, by education, which was part of Union University. So my diploma says Union. Oh, well. On it, so uh, I don't meet many alumni down here. <laughs> from back where we were from. So tonight I'll I'll talk a little bit, but I want it to be really interactive because I I have some observations. I get the privilege of talking to businesses all the time, most of which uh, companies are members of, or you have worked for companies that are members of. So I work for you. So this is an audition for me. So go back and say good <laughs> and, and if they're not, tell me first. And that'll be really helpful to pay in the mortgage next month. So uh, what I want to talk about is how we got here a little bit. A little bit about the chamber and what role we play in there and how we're uh, a little bit unique. And then talk about, uh, this is where I really need your help. We've had some observations about the world and our communities here. North Carolina's place in this country and the region and the world, and kind of how confusing it is right now, uh, in a couple of, across a couple of different dimensions, and how we're trying to figure out how we play and how we continue to be the best place in the country. And I would argue one of the best places in the world to live, work, and raise a family. Because at the end of the day, it's about having a place that has a climate, so people have the opportunity to have a good job so that they can live a good life, raise their kids, send them to school. So I'm like, I got three children, they all went to state schools here, they all have no debt. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. There's very few places in the country that can happen. Right? I'm very blessed, I was with Glaxo 19 years before I joined, I, I did state government affairs and advocacy work that whole time, uh, lobbied in every state, uh, and I've been to every state capital. Officially made it to Anchorage about a month ago. <laughs> uh, there was a 
we go to the state chambers and met there. And we went there because my wife uh, was born in Germany, lived all over the world, but she her favorite time was in Alaska. Yeah. So we had to go. We had a chance to go back for quick and back for years to Alaska. She was great for her. I grew up south of the Finger Lakes. Never watched snow again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, except on television. I'm glad to take a sleigh ride with my grandchildren. I took two of those. But uh, I've had great experiences working for great people. Learned a lot. Uh, but the next, what we're going to see in the future, is something we've never seen before. Uh, Y'all are on the front edge of that. Uh, you know, we haven't seen great pace of innovation like this, not in my lifetime, not probably since the original Industrial Revolution. We've never <laughs> seen things change this fast. Nobody's yeah. been here. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. We don't have the answers. We only get them from people like you that we talk to. So uh, vision and mission, we got it really down pretty clear. Uh, we want to be the best state for private sector job growth in the country, if not the world. That feeds the communities, that gives us the resources that we need to build our schools, to put our infrastructure, road rails, ports, waters, through all that stuff. Uh, we do that in four ways. Research, develop, advocate, and communicate for solutions and policy statewide that helps North Carolina be that place. We, uh, we have great relationships with our local chambers. So we're a statewide chamber. We have members all across the state, from Manny to Murphy. We work with our local chambers. They're the grassroots, eyes and ears of what's going on in communities all across our state. I've been in the advocacy work now since I graduated uh, pharmacy school. I graduated in 1986, went to Washington, uh, did a residency in D.C., and have been in this role, in addition to practicing pharmacy the first 10 years, as I was paying off my debts and I was uh, trying to start a life. Uh, but... The best lobbyists, you know, I get the privilege of aggregating a bunch of voices, and we'll talk about the chamber in a second, uh, of a lot of people. But the best lobbyist is you, the constituent. Right? I get to go D.C. a little bit. Uh, thank God not too much, because I still have a bit of sanity left. <laughs> you know, what's that? What do you say about D.C.? It's 23 square miles surrounded by reality. <laughs> you know, a bunch we all live in. Uh, and, but I get the privilege of aggregating the voices, but you all are the best lobbyists. You know, the ability of people locally to petition government. Uh, it's, you know, I, we got to make sure that we're representing you. And so when people come home to their communities, people like you that are serving, that they're hearing the same thing from you that they're hearing from us about what, what makes a, get a state competitive uh, for private sector job growth, which feeds the engine for all the resources we need to, to build a good state. So what is, what's the chamber do? Uh, we have about 700 members. All state, uh, statewide, they're in every part of the area. A bunch of smaller members that are part of local chambers that we are, are our members. If you're an employer of 10 or less and you belong to your local chamber, that's that works with us. You get our stuff. Yeah. But, and so we we have a couple of different ways we look at it. So we have this group of businesses that comes together to advocate for common things. We represent 23 different industry segments. So we're extraordinarily diverse in opinion. We try to dis disseminate all those opinions, aggregate those opinions into common threads. We have a 501c3, which doesn't take any government money, is all privately fed by your companies, uh, nonpartisan. We just do research and says, what are the facts about what it takes to be the best state in the country to, to grow jobs? So well, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go through the Legal Institute, which is advocacy in the courts. We are the chamber is advocacy in business education about what are those policies and initiatives that help a state to be productive, help a state to, to have good business climate. We have a PAC, traditional PAC, uh, all separate board, no news money goes into that, it's an individual decision, no corporate money goes into it. Uh, and a political program, which uh, we'll be publishing in about a week, what we do there is we publish how they voted for our state legislature. We don't care about partisan designation, we list everybody alphabetically. We publish an annual agenda for advocacy down at the General Assembly here in North Carolina. We just care how you vote. And uh, we acknowledge, we say, here's our agenda ahead of time. We tell people ahead of time what our issues are, and how they vote, how they vote. And we just tell our members who that is so they can make individual decisions about who they, who they support. Together, that it represents a pretty powerful force. Uh, and down in, in the North Carolina General Assembly and in the, the agencies about what you are telling us, what your companies are telling us, what people across the state are telling us 
and means to create a job so that people have that opportunity to build their community. So 2010, uh, we weren't doing that great. North Carolina's a great state. We had a lot going for it. Incredible university systems, great climate. We have RTP, we got Charlotte, we've got great natural resources, uh, but we weren't as competitive as we needed to be on those key business metrics. So in 2012, uh, we went to, real quick stories, we went to Pinehurst with our leadership, our volunteer leadership. I was leading the advocacy uh, group at the time, and we were talking about what's the five-year strat plan for the organization? You know, what is the chamber strategic plan? It shifted about halfway through, and what happened is they said, well, who's got the plan for the state? Where is this economic security plan for the citizens of North Carolina? And it was in pieces, but all those pieces were vertical pieces. They weren't across the organization. So we developed something called Vision 2030, which we'll talk about briefly, which says, okay, if we're here in 2012, and we know we're going to get 3 million more people by 2030, which we've already surpassed, right? That's the entire population of South Carolina at the time. We've had more than the entire population of South Carolina back in 2013 come here already. Right? And so we said, what is that what what do we have to look like by 2030 to be a top state for, for growing jobs and for living a great quality of life? And they developed a plan called Vision 2030. And it's still on our website and it guides our annual plan. So where are we? What have we achieved? What have we got left to achieve? Um, we started here in the 70s. Right? And here's where we are today. Incredibly different. We went through some tough times. Right, as the state changed, the state evolved uh, with it. Uh, but now, our greatest strength in North Carolina is there's no one industry that can bring this state down. You go to other places, we're talking about it at dinner, it could be an automaker, it could be manufacturing, it could be a number of different things. I grew up in Endicott, New York. My dad was a 40-year IBM veteran. He got my way through great schools, got most of my college paid for, the day that IBM pulled out is like a ghost town. One entity. Right? And so we as North Carolina, we have a great diversity of industry here. And that's the reason our highs maybe aren't as high and our lows aren't as low as we kind of just go like this. That's why we're continuing to grow. That's part of the reason we're where we are. So what do we focus on? Well, historically, if you just do this, we'll be better. If you just do this, we'll be better. You all know that you gotta be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, right? It's not just <laughs> one thing that helps helps things work better. So we came up with three pillars, education and talent supply. You can get everything else right. You can get the tax climate right and, all, and those right, and you can get the input. But if you don't have the people, you don't have the aligned education and workforce development system that continually create opportunities to learn and opportunities to retrain and to be a continuous learner, it doesn't matter. So we developed a strategy on education and talent to help do that. Work in progress as always, you always can be better. We're doing pretty good. We've got great universities, community college systems, K-12 is continuing to improve, uh, both public and private. Uh, always got to stay vigilant there. Competitive business climate, tax, court, civil liability, regulatory reform, healthcare, what goes into the direct cost of a job? How are we comparing both regionally and nationally about that? There's a plan in there. And infrastructure and growth, road, rails, water, port, sewer, broadband, and IT hardware. Right? That was just over the last two or three years that we said, well, wait a second, that's a, we can't do it. The pandemic, as we all talked about in so many different ways, said, okay, we put a bright light on things we already knew. Uh, but if we didn't have the hardware, how could everybody have worked the way we did? We could have everything set up, but if we didn't have that infrastructure in place going through there. So those are where we focus. This is just a couple of different things, uh, statements about sometimes while that stuff is really clear when we publish an agenda, a lot of work that uh, we're asked to do is to make sure people don't go too far in any direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so whether it's ESG, whether we're talking about energy, you know, our folks, whether you're a manufacturer or an IT company or you're a bank, you want all of the above energy policy. 
right? You want it to be zero emission, you want to move and you want to be sensitive to the environment. Businesses don't want dirty water or dirty air any more than anybody else does. Uh, but you have to have an imbalance, you have to have a plan. Uh, you have to know how to transition that. It needs to be inclusive in every dimension. Uh, free market stuff, you know, the market creates opportunities for people to save money uh, when you bring things together or you create market share differences. So the pharmacy benefit manager is an example of that. Uh, when we look at, our, so we're, we're learning a lot. We continue to learn a lot. If you listen, you learn a lot. People tell you what they need. If we're going to stay competitive, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Housing and childcare are the issues that we have to reimagine if we're going to stay competitive. Not only grow jobs here, not only make sure our citizens that are here and their families have an opportunity, but how do we continue to attract people? We've got to be able to look at housing. You know, we used to say affordable housing. It's just housing, right? For people of all across the economic spectrum, we have to figure out how we can help people uh, in childcare. We will talk about a couple of things that we're going to pilot, but we got to reimagine it. We can't let the biases of the past or our, our experiences entirely govern what we have to do going forward because it's a whole new world that, while confusing and noisy, presents a lot of opportunity uh, for us, too. So, we, uh, you know, we, we do live in a really hostile, sometimes political world, acrimonious. These are the four leaders of the House and the Senate, uh, all at uh, one of our events. Very different philosophically, but they have one thing in common. Maybe there's a different path, uh, but they all want to get to the same point. And actually, about 80% of the stuff that you'd never hear about, these four fellows who lead our House and Senate work on together. And they're friends. Uh, they're going to fight like heck on some issues. And it's going to be public. But on 80% of the issues that help create jobs, help make sure we have a good education system, they work together for, for common good. So here's where we begin to talk about the future. So before I go there, I should probably back up so you don't think about that too much. Uh, <laughs> where we were, where we're here, we needed a plan. Uh, business community came together, created a, an entity that was, pri was all privately funded, nonpartisan, just the facts, data-driven, and our foundation. We put a program around it of advocacy and accountability through a nonpartisan political program saying these are the folks that are with us. We went from where we were in 2010 to the only the fourth state to be number one for business two years in a row by CNBC. And you don't apply for that one. All the other ones you can kind of buy. But I'm going to be really can't, <laughs> right? Buy the advertisement. All those other ones you can kind of manipulate, for lack of a better description, not to be too candid. Uh, but CNBC doesn't tell you anything. They don't, you don't apply. We just learned they released uh, this year the 86 metrics that they use, but they don't tell you everything. You just got to do it, and they tell you how it measures up. And so we've done it two years in a row. Each year, the number one reason is because we keep investing, not, not only because of intentionally getting a competitive business climate or making those infrastructure investments or valuing all levels and all forms of our education. Uh, but they said it's about people. The reason North Carolina's went in is not only do we produce them, do we have good systems, workforce systems, but people are coming here for a reason. Uh, they're coming here without jobs because they know they can find one or they can know they can get the education and training they need through our community college university mm -hmm. systems and our workforce development boards. Right? Are we perfect? No. But we're doing it as well or better than anybody. So it's about people. If we're going to three P, which I predict we will, then you know, I'll probably, I don't know. It's never been done before because there's a lot of reasons. The secret sauce before we talk about the future is out in the open, right? They know how we did it. A lot of hard work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of people working together, a lot of tough, hard discussions, a lot of debate. But we're here, and now we're the now we're you know what's what's that? It's hard to win your first championship, right? It's really hard. Super hard to repeat, right? 
Three peats are unheard of, right? Can we be the first one? <clears throat> we have all the ingredients. Do we have the courage, you know, to make those investments? Uh, do we get complacent because everybody tells us how good we are, <laughs> right? Do we fail to innovate? You know, if you're in business and you're not operating, changing, innovating, listening to your customers, listening to your people, you don't stay in business very long, right? So for us, the biggest challenge going into this environment I'm going to describe, uh, as we see it, I love your reaction to it, because you're actually the first people outside of our internal that's going to see this matrix. Uh, we did it to our board. Uh, we talked to, you know, you're listening. But do we have the courage to go forward? And what we're doing because it would never happen. So before I go on, anything you want to talk about there for a few minutes? Um, I'm like the most apolitical person that you meet. Can you name those people for me and tell me which one represents our region in Raleigh? Well, <laughs> uh, Senator Dan Blues from here in Raleigh. Okay. Uh, he is former Speaker of the House, incredible public servant. He's almost 80 years old. You'd never know it. Uh, so he's Democrat. Uh, he's the minority leader in the, in the Senate. Paul Newton is the majority leader in the Senate from Concord area of the state. Former Duke Energy executive, uh, was president of Duke Energy, the Carolinas, retired from that position, went back home, started a, a business with his wife, and then decided to do public service. Okay. That's Robert Reeves from Sanford. Oh, representative Robert Sanford, Reeves yeah. from Sanford, who's the minority leader in the House, an attorney, incredibly thoughtful person. And that's John Bell, who's the majority leader in the House down from near Goldsboro. Goldsboro. Mm -hmm. okay. So different parts of the state, clearly different backgrounds with it. Clearly have, uh, real, I mean, Senator Blue, and uh, they're all native North Carolinians. Oh, really? Yep. All from different places, different, different places they grew up, uh, different journeys with it. Quite like cats and dogs on fundamental issues. But they do it respectfully, they do it honorably. Uh, you won't hear any of these folks talking acrimoniously or taking personal assaults on the other. Right? And so uh, they, they really do want that stuff out. Oh, thank you. Well, one of the things um, you mentioned was you know, supporting and the infrastructure for daycare and mm -hmm. some things. What I didn't hear was anything about um, as our community ages and the increase in disabilities. Um, I was reading reports last night, I have a special needs um, son, that there was this um, effort and reports that started in like 2016 and they reported out like where those efforts are going. Um, right now, I think there's something like 12,000 people in the state of North Carolina on the waiting list for the waiver program. And so it's not clear like where we fit in the U.S. because we're amongst some of the highest in the country, all the red states are, with waiting lists for people with support for disabilities. And like, where do we fit in? If people are rapidly coming here, those numbers, the aging population, more needs are going to just increase. Absolutely. And we could find ourselves like Texas, which has 232,000 people on that waiting list, mm -hmm. which is a really, really disappointing thing because the federal government gives that money to the state to determine how they oh, choose exactly. to implement it. Yeah, so uh, the question is, we have an aging population, we have growth coming, and with that comes people from all different backgrounds and all different needs, right? So well, how are we preparing for people with special needs? How are we preparing for an aging population? There's a there's <clears throat> current federal government money that comes to the state. The state decides how that money goes out. So how are we preparing for that? Uh, and the question is, we're not. That's the courage. That's the next step. If we're going to meet our needs, so we have two times as many jobs in this country as we have people that are looking for work, able to work, that are part of the workforce participation. And that includes people from all backgrounds. Uh, so what are we doing for a neurodiverse community? Mm -hmm. right? What are you doing for an aging community who thought they were ready to retire? Pandemic hits, everything's good. Now the stock market's like this, and they have to come back in. We're going to have four, maybe almost five generations in the workforce, right? Depending on where you cut off these different generation plans. So if we're going to meet our needs, we have to look at justice involved. We have to look at our special needs community, veterans and the spouses of veterans that are that are coming 
people, the community. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out immigration mm -hmm. as, as a country. Uh, and that brings all the all the populations together too. So that's that's the challenge, right? Who's gonna, if North Carolina, uh, I want our country to do well, uh, right after North Carolina. <laughs> so, uh, we, we live here, we're building this state and community together. So it's incredibly important, and I appreciate you saying that, that we have to do it all. Gary, it's well known. We have a wonderful university system, uh, wonderful health care. And I'm talking throughout the state. One of the challenges for this country, but speak to North Carolina about what does the what is the chamber's role? Um, you mentioned climate at the very beginning, and you put number one up there, education. What is the chamber's role, if any, in improving the K through 12 in this state because I know from Plano, Texas, where I lived for 20 years, many families would move into the Plano area because of the K through 12 education standard um, mm -hmm. that attracted a lot of people. So what is the chamber's role and what's the state doing to improve um, the quality of teaching in the K through 12? Yeah, I mean, our, our role from where we sit at the statewide chamber is really is really straightforward. It's can we help our K-12 system, public education system, and K-12 private to some degree, is uh, can we help them innovate, develop, and align with the current state of where the demand is in the business community in preparation? Mm -hmm. right. So we have a model that's 1930s based. Mm -hmm. You know, butts and seats, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the money doesn't follow the China, mm -hmm. right? It goes to the entity. And we're really not aligned mm -hmm. at all. Uh, our state is unique in that we have an appointed Board of Education by the sitting governor. We have an elected superintendent. Even when they were the same party, they didn't get along. They should work well. Right? That's overseeing the K-12 system. All great public servants, all good people trying to do the best they can, regardless of which side. You get into that because you're trying to do well. But the constitutional alignment is off. Right? And so uh, I don't know if we can solve what we've told them. you got to do a couple things. <laughs> and uh, But we're not going to say which one because... When I tell you, you're going to say, yeah, you wouldn't have a job if you had to decide which one to do. you got to take the vote away from the people. I'm the state superintendent. That's in the Constitution, so you'd have to do a constitutional amendment. you got to take the appointment authority away from the governor because it's in the Constitution, so you'd have to vote to do that. Or you got to do both and replace it with something in order to create that alignment. Right? Many states, when you win the governor's mansion, it's a cabinet position. You put your education person in there to drive your agenda and your ideas. It doesn't matter what party it was. You can't do that here. Uh, because of just the way our constitutional structure is. Because of, it goes really back to who North Carolina is. is we don't like anybody really in charge. We don't like kings mm -hmm. here in North Carolina. It goes back to our history. It goes back to how our governing was put together. So our role is to say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, but there are good pockets of things going around. And how do we incrementally change the policy to align with the needs of the people? And when not only jobs are today, but the jobs are going to be there tomorrow, how do we create lifelong learners? Structurally, are we going to change that? Probably not. There's not enough money. And in this really tough, acrimonious political world we live in, we can do better by looking at local communities, what they're doing well, highlight that, get more communities say, I want that. <coughs> so we're spending a lot of time in our foundation doing that kind of work right now. And say, well, what's in the way? Well, if you just tweak these two things, maybe we could do that more statewide. Mm -hmm. I'm on the My Future NC board, which set the two million by 2030 goal uh, of postgraduate education. So we're trying to identify in eight regions around the state. People are doing really good work. You know, let's find it. let's catch them being good. Right? People are working around the system to take care of their kids and their communities and uh, align the K-12 education system. They are. Early colleges are working. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need more of them. So let's highlight that because we're not going to change the structural. There's not enough, not enough money, not enough courage. Do we have pathways for tech schools? 
Is that enough? After building those, because it's out in Lake Gaston area, there was the NC State grad who built one from the old high school. We got to a bring great it into one. that area, which was phenomenal. We got a great one here in Southeast Raleigh, the, the Vernon Malone Academy, that you, ninth and tenth grade are the same, and then you can choose to go preparatory for college, or you can go into the trade. Mm. So the, and so it's a great school mm. in Wake County. Wake Tech has good early high school. That's happening in Cabarrus. It's happening all through our state. That people are just saying, "We're going to do this," mm. uh, and. There's like two camps, right? There's one to say, well, we really can't cause. There's one to say, we really can and we're going to. Mm -hmm. And so let's spend more time on the really can and we're going to. Does that, does that help? Ambiguous as a good mm -hmm. lobbyist can be. <laughs> <laughs> anything anything else about where we were, how we got here before we jump into where we're going, where we're going the, the dimensions that we're trying to juggle? So we were talking earlier, uh, I was in, uh, I had the opportunity to go out some university folks to California, to Palo Alto, and visit Apple. And mm -hmm. so we spent a day uh, with the Apple team, and that's a story which was fascinating. Uh, you know, going to their campus, getting into the campus, uh, walking around the outside of the building, it's a mile and a half. <laughs> And in the middle was this beautiful garden, and uh, and the people and the energy. It's, it was just something that was hard to explain until you experience it. But a very different place, uh, in, in in really good ways. And so that's coming here. Yeah. Uh, we learned a lot, and uh, when we were there, so I had the opportunity to go out there, and then we went with a group called the Institute for the Future, which I encourage you to look them up online where they talk about what are these triggers and what are these events that determine what's going to happen in the future. And they've been right a lot. They don't call themselves forecasting, but there are, there are moments, there are triggers, there are direct things that happen that lead you to a place. So it's called the Institute for the Future, been around since the late 60s, started by NASA to make sure we could get out to the moon and stay there before people were thinking about it or could think we could sustain it. They came up with a couple of dimensions, and where we are right now, uh, and I'll talk about each of these quadrants a little bit, but we have almost zero faith in our institutions. It doesn't matter what institution it is as, as a society. The, the, the faith in institutions is really, really low, right? And, and, and we also have low or high social, low social cohesion. So what does that mean? That means we don't trust and we don't get along. So what happens when that happens? So our bullet, what we're trying to think about as we look at this is what does that mean for North Carolina, for our competitiveness, for our ability to grow, retain jobs here in North Carolina? So when we have, and these aren't in any order or any particular place in the quadrant, I haven't plotted them, I just put them in there as we're trying to sort out. When you have low trust in institutions, and that includes the media, which was our source of unbiased information in our country's history, mm -hmm. right? Now, when, when the media is trusted less than a lobbyist, you know something's wrong. <laughs> I'm a pharmacist. I'm the most trusted profession to the least trusted profession. Until my dad passed, they didn't understand any of that. So how do you go from the, the media is below that now? Mm -hmm. So your family's number one. Source of and your employer's number two. Media's down here. Okay. All of our polling, public policy polling just came out with something. Our own individual polling, we do a CEO poll every year, about 800 CEOs. No matter who you look at, no matter what side of the political equation you're on, the data is coming back the same. There's just such low trust in, in our current institutions that we rely on so much. Going forward. So, High uncertainty, we get activism and populism that we're seeing, again, on both uh, extremes. Uh, you get a really unpredictable legal climate. That tension between employer and employee is as high as we've ever seen it, right, about the new workplace we're looking at. Uh, people are holding on their money. North Carolina's, a, North Carolina's an outlier with the announcements we made last year. We made record 
We haven't made any big announcements this year. Since the beginning of the year. We're out of mega sites. We're kind of still, but we're not making those. People are going on their money. Right? In a low uncertainty, high cohesion. Uh, people have more cash on hand. And for all of the different dimensions, they're really good and, and there's really challenging. Private equity is on the rise. North Carolina is a good place to do private equity uh, uh, transaction. But that also means that families that had their own business, their own family farms, their own medical practice that don't have a way to get their money out of it, private equity is coming into places it hadn't really come before. So what does that mean for the fabric of our manufacturing family and manufacturer? What's it mean for our farms? What's it mean for a great medical practice that doesn't have family to give it to? So it's, 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 it's really confusing and, and incohesive. So uh, we'll talk about the NC Chamber in a second. And uh, so we think we're here. This is where we think we are now. A lot of noise, uh, a lot of uncertainty, pandemic accelerated that happened. It was happening before. We have a birth rate that's half of what it was 24 years ago. Half, there's not many people, there's not many people to fill the jobs that we have, right? Our systems are, are, are not aligned. It's just a very different time. But that's what gives us opportunity. So second piece, High, they had a high trust in institution, low social cohesion. You know, the unions are institutions too. They serve a valuable role. We're the least United States in the, in the country right now. We think that's competitive as we know it is. Uh, but there's places that aren't. Uh, big government, high regulation. Some areas good, some areas not good. Doesn't at least help innovation, right? Take AI. We got to make sure we're responsible, augmented reality, robot, all that stuff in there. Good. But if you regulate it too much, you stifle the innovation that we need to have. So, what's that balance? Shareholder employee activism, activism is, is rewarded in a low cohesion environment. It creates uncertainty for businesses investing. You can go back and forth. Again, this is all new. So, I, I'm not wedded to any of this. I love your, I'd love your immediate reactions to it. We're just trying to put some order to a disorderly place. So if you have high cohesion and you have high trust, you might be able to get immigration reform done, which we haven't really done in a long time. So my family came over between 1909 and 1911. Three of my grandparents were from the same town in southern Italy. Came to work for Indicott Johnson Shoes because they needed 20,000 employees for the three tanneries and factories in Indicott. When Andy, Mr. Indicott and Mr. Johnson got together, one from Boston area, the, the other from, to build this entity, which gave people their lives, we figured out immigration from now. Yeah, it wasn't a border like we're challenged with now. We figured it out. We figured out before the internet, we figured it out. We can figure it out. We can protect our borders have high walls, big gates, a system to do that. But you need high trust in institutions, which we don't have. And you need high social cohesion, where the good trumps the individual. So uh, low trust in institutions, high cohesion. Uh, so we have low trust in insti institutions right now. If we have high social cohesion, uh, what's that mean for the business climate? Unknown, but it could be better. Business you. So we were talking a little bit earlier. Businesses are not going to wait for our institutions that are way behind and don't change and operate at the rate and pace of business to order to attract, retain, educate, retrain people in this environment that we're living in. They're not going to wait. They're going to create their own. They're going to create their own schools. It's already happening. Right? They're going to try to partner with a local K-12. They're going to try to partner with a community college. They're going to partner with the university. The university system in North Carolina just launched an entity called Project Kitty Hawk. Have you heard of Project Kitty Hawk? They're taking the 17 institutions, and they're going to go little by little. They started with North Carolina A&T, no, excuse me, North Carolina Central. And they're going to make 
degrees online for our whole university system. And you say what you want to do, and they'll tell you what university you can do, and you never have to leave your living room, other than some experiential components. So you can get a degree from Chapel Hill and be down east. And you can piecemeal it together. That just launched that two days ago is when they went online with Central. And they're going to bring ECO up next. The goal is to get all 17 campuses agreements so that any of us are working, are changing careers while we're working, that we can take advantage of that university system's opportunities from wherever we live. Their customer's business. Small and large. That changes everything. Why? Low trust in institution, because it hasn't changed this fast. You know, our university system here is saying, okay, we're going to meet people where they are. Interesting. We don't know if it's going to work, but it's we're supporting it because that kind of innovation needs to be supported. So before I move on, are we crazy? So we're currently worst quadrant, right? Low, low. <laughs> <laughs> where no one wants to be if this was Gartner. And you're trying to get us, usually this is the best quadrant for Gartner, high, high. Or are we trying to go low, high? Business climate, business you. I don't know yet. You don't know yet. I'm being honest. So what we think, because businesses don't like volatility, <clears throat> and because businesses are not here or there, so they don't like the extremes, we think if North Carolina is going to continue to win, we got to have the balance in the middle. That's why the JP. We think somewhere in there, depending on the issue, the time, the change, because things are going to change, the innovation, the rate and pace, we're going to have to float between them. So you want to be without, neutral. We want to be as neutral as we can be. So when we see ourselves being pulled in any direction, okay, what do we need to do to get back to the trap? So it's something neutral that's not volatile. Mm -hmm. All right, what can we agree on? What's working that we can agree on? Because I, I, we've not been here before, and so we got to try and figure a way to make sense mm -hmm. of a really senseless world right now in a lot of ways. Thank you. I, I don't know. But I, I, our folks just, man, uncertainty and volatility is not what any of our members, any industry, any size think is good. They just want solutions. A question well asked is half the answer. That looks like a question well asked. We don't know what the answer is yet, but it looks like you've laid out various elements of it that you can now discuss individually. I like that quote. Mm -hmm. Is that half of, a, half of the something. answer is a question well asked? Is that? Uh, I, I remember it is a question well asked as a is half, half the, the answer. answer. Is half the answer? Something like mm -hmm. that. There's probably a lot of other people have said it better, but well, I'm going to attribute it to you now. <laughs> <laughs> he has a PhD, I believe. Laid out well, so that you understand what the issues. Yeah. So have the right discussion to try to solve it, right? And I think the point was try to get everything neutral. The other piece of that puzzle was where do we need to be in three years, five years? Mm -hmm. Which are the most critical? I, you can't solve everything. Yeah, right, how do you right? move? Which are the most critical things to move the needle to get us where we need to be as a state three years, five years out? Mm -hmm. And which things maybe are still important, but you spend a little less energy on those because you're looking to really move the needle in a more impactful and determined way. Can you say, can you, you have said that this particular mix is not um, somewhere we've been. Have you seen this before? As you move these, is this present in other states or other situations where you've seen successful strategies employed against maybe some of the ones that we think we don't know on? I think our whole country's here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, think we were there <clears throat> similarly during the Depression? Like, we didn't have the technology. But I mean, I think there was some written research to show that a lot of these things during those times existed. You just didn't have the technology. You had we didn't have the, the rapid radio. exchange of information right. that we yeah. have now. Yeah. But are, I think, yeah. So are there, like, I know you said the whole country is in the apartment, but are there states that could be used as a benchmark that are somewhere in a good apartment? 
I, I think there's states that are doing some sites better than others, right. uh, but they're not doing as well as us. And, and so I don't think anybody's really, I, I don't see the challenge that we're wrestling with uh, is a, we're leading, right? So we're leading for a reason. So we may be able to benchmark on the education piece. We may be able to benchmark on intellectual property transfer out of our universities. Uh, but there are, but no one's got the talent thing figured out, mm -hmm. the alignment piece. But would, that, would there be like an opportunity where you could like do a collaboration oh, with yeah. the states together? Oh, it's yeah. Come up with a better solution on the talent side? I think so. Yeah, I think you start regionally. Uh, and, and yeah, I think there's opportunity. But so people can put the competitiveness aside for right. a moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just thinking sometimes you're competing though against these places to attract business and people. Yeah, yeah. Right now, one of our key advantages is we have a net in migration of talent that other states are envious of. Mm -hmm. Right. So can we use that to, <clears throat> to set a model that can be national? The other thing that North Carolina's not used to is that on a number of different dimensions. See, we were the Dixie Dynamo. We were this great little regional <coughs> thing that was happening for a long, long time. Now we're on the national stage. Or right, we're on a national stage for the political environment. You can't win a presidency without winning North Carolina. Right. We're on a national stage for control of the U.S. Senate on the political side. We have the largest military presence, maybe outside of California, but arguably, you know, with when we just visited Fort Bragg, we spent a day down, excuse me, Fort Liberty. Uh, when the White House picks up the phone and calls 911 and it's answered to Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. Literally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 3,000 3, men and women are deployed out of there every day to the hottest spots in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have good but when the world suffers, when something bad happens, it affects North Carolina. And how we respond, how we are postured, how we present ourselves is really important. That's a new place, right? We've always relished it, but now everybody knows it has a higher expectation of us, to your point about how do we lead uh, on any dimension. But it's, yeah, it'd be, it'd be good if, if there's an unbiased Absolutely. It's really important. Can we lead and can we drive people towards that? I hope. Were there um, studies after the, the Charlotte debacle that happened and businesses chose not to come here because of the bathroom thing? I don't know how many years ago it was now. I think it was right before COVID. Were there studies that were done afterwards, like how to not repeat. <laughs> that's why. We, well, that's why we have it. Right, and so well, I'm I'm just yeah. curious in what you know, how we continue to kind of grow from those things, and I think one of the challenges too is as we do strategic plans, we make the mistake. In my experience in IT, of doing a three to five year, seven year, it's like you can't. It has to be one, and even then you have to pivot, and you have to be able to change, and so. When you're doing, we just released ours at NC State, it's a five to seven year plan. I'm like, why would we release a five to seven year plan for technology? If we were sitting here five years ago for technology, would that plan be worth anything? Yeah. <laughs> right. and, and, and it's the same in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Right? So nothing looks like any cut Johnson shoes in. There's a couple places. I mean, you're going to have chemical plants, but even though they're incredibly automated and a whole lot safer than they were. Uh, there's always bad actors, and we should not tolerate any of that. Uh, but it's so different. Mm -hmm. I, I think the social, the media, the social media piece, the rapid exchange of information, true or not, as soon as you see it on that, you think it is, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and Google's really good; they're a great member of ours. But we say we Google it, and we assume it's true. Mm -hmm. Mostly, it is. I mean, they're great members of ours, I guess. You know, no, I know they're great members, but uh, but that's different. We had a newspaper before. I grew up with Walter Cronkite. It was a trusted institution, right? 60 uh, minutes. 60 minutes, yeah. <laughs> but people don't feel that way anymore. So that's, I think, to your point about studies about where we were, where, what can we learn. We can learn some things. Man, 
we're in a holy place. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we got to get her comfortable with. In that same vein, we're talking about in the year, and in that side mm -hmm. of what if it's something in the chambers for you to sort of invest in, like the independent local media that's gotten hot enough, like the local newspapers, and re reinvesting in that to better trust, to better the social cohesion through a justice uh, news source through, through that thing? It could be. You know, we're not, we're not resourced for that right now. Uh, but we had a lot of discussion about because it's uh, it's really frustrating. You want it just a place that gives you the facts so that you can make a decision on your own. We're all smart people, right? We can bring things together. We can talk to our family. We can work through things out. So we talk about it. It's it's really you have to even businesses don't have that much money to change it as quickly as we'd like, right? We we would like to go back. Boy, my wife's a reporter. Uh, and, uh, and and she got out of it. Went into teaching, was a great teacher. Um, first of all, it seems like this is whack-a-mole on a much bigger scale because you can fix Amen. something and it can be years before you can tell that it ruins something else, right? But my solution for, um, and yes, this is supposed to be funny, is to make a combination lie detector taser that everybody has to be attached to when they speak publicly. <laughs> you, like can, our you can take the lead. So well, yes, exactly <laughs> like our politicians. Right now. But also people, people on media. How would I be if they doing? don't believe it's true and they're still saying it, then they should get <laughs> zapped <laughs> until either they stop lying or they end up lying writhing around on the floor in a puddle of their own bodily fluids. <clears throat> and thank you, because I haven't gotten to share that before. So. <laughs> as long as you're not talking about me, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> no! Yes, no. I have. Um, so, really, maybe I'm not a social studies person, so I'm like, really, um, I, I have a two-part question. One is, like, now, how did you choose these dimensions? Because, like, and I understand that social cohesion is probably, like, you know, really, Interesting because we are also a diverse community, and so like from the diversity itself comes like you know, at what spectrum you lie on that diversity spectrum. As far as institutions go, I would say that like you know, the right size institution might be the like the size of institution or like kind of institution that we have that might be the dimension. But why would you choose trust in institution as a dimension? If, if you choose trust in institution, shouldn't it always be like really high trusted institution, no matter what size institution, no matter like you know, how much. Control the institutions have, but like you no, know, I I think like maybe there is an institution which should be extremely well trusted. So why would we choose those dimensions? Yeah, the uh, so I, I was I I've been fortunate in my career to go to a lot of different places, a lot of professional education. I had never been to a place like the Institute for the Futures uh, that showed us on so many ways how they arrived at this through polling, through data. Uh, and then we went back and we looked at our own polling and our own data over the last 11 years, and it said the same thing in a different way. So I don't know if these are the right ones, but I got to start somewhere. Okay, so this feedback is really, really helpful. Uh, I, we were out there just talking about education and the future of education, uh, about how we align things. And one thing was really interesting, which in the future, which is 2030, we all have investment <laughs> portfolios right now. Right, or maybe we all well, we all have a way to save money for retirement. By 2030, the generations that are coming behind us are going to have income portfolios, in addition to savings and investment portfolios. So you can work from wherever you come from. Right, you can work this maybe you work in the day for this company, night here, different dimensions. Maybe you work in a coffee shop. All that stuff that historically was really frowned upon. Right. Uh, the gig economy that that's going to be normal, right? We can not like it. You know, I'm 60 years old. I can not understand it. That doesn't mean it's not going to be real, right? And that we don't have to think and listen and learn and adjust. So that's the cohesion part that began to resonate with me. And uh, we were trying to, and the feedback's really good. We were just trying with our with our leadership and our board to give them some framework to have hard discussions. So that we picked them. And, and that's a good point. It could be 
we can go one level deeper and say, okay, what size, how does size affect that? We haven't studied. So thank you. You think um, trust in businesses instead of trust in institutions might be a more valuable metric? Because, like, you know, what's going on with Google and mm -hmm. stuff with Apple and TikTok, that, you know, that correlates to how people spend money, how people do things. Even, like, people are going to college, but if people don't, like, want to work for a company or a company doesn't hire them, it doesn't do anything for the economy. Yeah. And so, like, I'll Could just, be. Yeah. I mean, I was just—I was at the Keenan Institute today for an event, and uh, and it was a uh, frontiers, and we we're talking about the future of the workforce, what that looks like, and folks brought up the same point. I mean, there's there's low trust in businesses. It's generation. There are generational differences, for good reasons. With it. so yeah, that that could be a piece too. It's really so when we poll people, it's, it, there's there's this stuff that. So you, when you pull a person about, should a business be involved in a social issue? Generally speaking, people don't want corporations involved in that. But it's okay if mine does. Yeah. Right? So we're trying to sort out, I want my company to represent my feelings. Because otherwise I don't want to work for that company. That's a shift. That's a, a, a uh, but we don't really want companies, because we don't trust them, saying that, the company thinks this, and it represents me, unless it agrees with me. So we're in that cohesion part, to your point. Yeah, I think we could do the same thing with business, and plot it and have hard discussions. Yeah. Is, and my, my understand, I just want to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah, no, because I personally, I've seen business influence in education. Because like, businesses like, NC State gets funded by SARS, and yeah. um, what's his name, not Todd, um, this one guy just donated money, and like even our own university, oh, yeah. they, their whole programs kicked off from being donated. So like businesses affect everything, really. So mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, they do. And I think it's a it's a dynamic about can we get together and agree on how we change together? Otherwise, people are going to change to benefit their needs. Yeah, good point. I'm at 804. We're okay. Is this the last slide? We've uh, been on this slide. Did you have more? Uh, oh, maybe. Yeah, this is the last one. <laughs> so we've already talked about it. Uh, you know, we, it's been embedded everything, but I found that if you don't put it down on paper, then people just kind of talk around it. But there's all. This is a lot of the cohesion issues. This mm -hmm. is a lot of the trust issues uh, that go across. So political headwinds of the 2024. North Carolina's gonna be really noisy, right? Uh, we've got a presidential election. We're in the middle of that, whether we want to be or not, right? We got an open governor seat, whether we want to be or not. Attorney general seat, whole legislature's up. People talk in hyperbole and extremes, and they say stupid stuff, right? And uh, and so party fringes, dark money. Super PACs, uh, no matter where, if they exist, right, feel about them, they're legal. So we gotta figure out how to navigate with them, for sure. Uh, digs and daycare, homes, home, uh, excuse me, housing and job care. Really important issues. Uh, how is life together versus this, right? Uh, the courts, our position is they gotta be balls and strikes, whether they're populist, or whether they're activists, uh, they just call balls and strikes, no matter what party that they're on. And uh, it's going to be like this. 2024 is going to be drought volatile. We're going to be center stage. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around the world that affects North Carolina mm -hmm. because of our agriculture industry, which is $103 billion a year this year. Agriculture, agribusiness. We don't just feed North Carolina. We feed the world. And we have some of the most innovative agribusiness companies in the world here doing incredible things. So what does that mean when the world needs food, right? What better ways to get their crops? So we're in a different place. Awesome. Let's connect. Thank you for the feedback. And thank you.
unique and honor to be here in the three month free month event. So if you're not traveling and in town, I know you have all of North Carolina, just not Valley Vero. Thank you. Um, next month at Blue Cross, we'd love to see you, or you can send someone from your team. You can still proxy your seat even as a speaker. So. Okay, and I got the directions. Next three months, we have the Did you follow? I got them. Did you see that? You got <laughs> so, Oprah's memorable. <laughs> Um, connect with Gary, and now you all have a little bit more time, like a half hour to hang out, network, make more friends, make more connections, and we will see you next month at Blue Cross. Cross. Blue Shield. Thank you. Thank you.